Li Tang Ching Wen, the director of e 2020, to say a few words. Please welcome Miss Emily. Thank you so much, Balkis. Good morning to all participants. Thank you for joining us today for our e 2020 Day 1 event. It requires a collaborative effort from everyone to eliminate such deep-rooted stigma in society. Each year, we hold our campaign in University of Malaya. However, as MCO commences, we decided to shift our event to an online platform. It is important that despite in the COVID-19 pandemic, we continue to celebrate and support the cause of World AIDS Day. We, in ERASE, which stands for Eradicate AIDS and Stigma, for equality, believe that a simple act in the community, such as spreading the right information about HIV and AIDS towards family and friends, can produce a ripple effect whereby we can create a change in our community's perception in HIV and AIDS. ERASE would like to spread awareness in the hopes that the public will acknowledge the issue of stigma and discrimination against people living with HIV and advocate for the elimination of such obstacles. I would like to take the opportunity to thank each of our ERASE members who put their heart and soul into this event. And this event would not exist if it were not all for you. Once again, I would like to thank everyone for joining this event. Without further ado, I will pass the floor back to Balkis for the next activity of our event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miss Emily, for the wonderful speech. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll proceed with a video presentation on HIV and AIDS prepared by UM's ERASE in collaboration with the Flash Ed team. Please pay your full attention to the video that we're screening just about now, as we'll be having a Kahoot session regarding its content after the video. Enjoy! And welcome to ERASE 2020. My name is Ko Zui. And I am Tristan. So Tristan, what are we going to talk about today? We are going to introduce some basic concepts about HIV and AIDS to everyone. Okay, so how much do you guys actually know about HIV and AIDS? Let's get started, Zui. Do you know what is HIV and AIDS? Of course, HIV stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus, while AIDS stands for Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. Yes, HIV leads to AIDS, and AIDS is considered to be the most latest stage of HIV. Basically, HIV is the virus, while AIDS is the condition caused by HIV. It is important for everyone to know about HIV and AIDS. An untreated HIV-infected person will be suffering from symptoms caused by opportunistic infections. For your information, opportunistic infections occur more frequently and more severely with people with weak immune system. For example, people living with HIV. Here is the reason why. CD4 T cells are a type of white blood cell found in the human body which are responsible for disposing of bacteria, viruses, and other invading agents. HIV can lower down CD4 T cell counts. The lower the CD4 T cell counts, the weaker the immune system is and the higher chances for people living with HIV to get an opportunistic infection. Opportunistic infections can affect all parts of the body. Some common examples being cryptococcal meningitis, toxoplasmosis, and pneumocytes carinii pneumonia. Now you might be wondering, how does one actually get HIV? Well, only body fluids from a person who has HIV can transmit HIV. 
The body fluids include blood, semen, breast milk, vaginal fluids, and anal mucus. HIV can be transmitted when these body fluids enter the body of another person, for example, through sexual intercourse. Infected vaginal fluid or semen can enter a partner's body via mucous membranes present in their vagina, anus, or the top of the penis. Among all, anal sex is the riskiest form of sex for transmitting and contracting HIV. Once the virus enters the body, it then proceeds to make many copies of itself. HIV can also pass on from mother to baby during pregnancy, birth, or breastfeeding. However, if a mother who is infected with HIV complies with HIV therapy as prescribed throughout the pregnancy and childbirth, the risk of transmitting the virus can be kept to a minimum. HIV can be easily transmitted by the sharing of needles, syringes, or any other injecting equipment. These used equipment might have the blood of others on them, and as we know, blood carries HIV. At the same time, you run the risk of catching Hepatitis B and Hepatitis C if you continue to share your needles with other individuals. One interesting fact here is that HIV cannot survive outside the body and it cannot reproduce outside a host. Thus, you can't get HIV by touching, hugging, or shaking hands. Do not hesitate to give your friends who are HIV infected your warm big hugs. Mingle around with them, give them your utmost support so that they can have normal daily lives just like us. Besides, HIV cannot be transmitted through coughing or sneezing. Sharing utensils with infected people does not expose you to the virus too, so don't worry. Oh, I have a phone call. Hello? Hello, this is Uncle Mark over here. I want to ask about HIV can ah. Alright, I'll connect you to Dr. Dailami. Welcome doctor. I heard that we can get HIV after getting bitten by the mosquito. True ah doctor. Well, hello there uncle. Well, actually uncle, mosquitoes do not spread HIV. When insects bite, they do not inject the blood of the last person they bit. So, there is no evidence that they can pass on the HIV virus that way. Are you, you serious ah? How come it's like that? Then, women who have HIV can have babies or not? Yes, fortunately uncle, young women who are HIV positive are fertile and can have children. If a HIV positive pregnant woman takes the right medication before giving birth, her children might not have HIV infection. After giving birth, both mother and baby can take medication to prevent the infection from passing to the baby through breastfeeding. So, is it that HIV is the same as AIDS? Pochi! Pochi! If I am HIV positive, then I have AIDS too. Uh. Don't scare me like that, uh, doctor. No, 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 no. You don't have to be scared, uncle. HIV is the virus, while AIDS is the disease. There is treatment for HIV positive people to be complied with to make sure the viral load is low and thus prevent them from getting AIDS. Doctor, can we know whether a person has HIV or not? Because I'm very afraid of any of them like right? this. Well, actually uncle, we cannot tell whether a person has HIV infection because they look and feel well just like us. There may be a long period of time for HIV positive people to show any signs of infection. And you don't have to be scared of them, Uncle, because you won't get infected just by talking or hugging them. Rest assured, Uncle. Okay, Doctor, that was terrific. You are absolutely super. Thank you, Doctor. You very check up. Lah. Bye bye, Doctor. <laughs> Thank you, Uncle. Take care. So, as you heard from Dr. Dynami, HIV is not AIDS, and today, there are many ways of preventing HIV transmission. You can protect yourself and others from HIV by using condoms the right way while having sex. Condoms are highly effective in preventing HIV and other sexually transmitted diseases. 
it is important to learn the correct way to use a condom. For further details, here's the link. Limiting the number of sexual partners is one of the essential measures to avoid the transmission of HIV too. The more sexual partners you have, the more likely you are to come in contact with one of your partners who has been exposed to HIV. If you need to inject drugs, never ever share needles, syringes or other drug injecting equipment. Use new, clean syringes every time you inject. Remember, sharing is caring does not apply here. You can protect yourself from HIV infections by getting regularly tested too. Know your status and do not be afraid to seek treatment if you are HIV positive. This can avoid any delay in treatment and improve outcomes. Unfortunately, as of now, there are no available vaccines to prevent HIV infection. However, the good news is, you may be able to make use of HIV prevention medicines such as pre-exposure prophylaxis PREP, and post-exposure prophylaxis PEP. Taking PREP is the measure to prevent contracting HIV for people who are at risk of getting infected. It is proven that PREP is highly effective in preventing HIV if the medicine is taken as prescribed by a doctor. PEP is the use of medicine within 72 hours of exposure to HIV to prevent infection. The sooner you start PEP, the better the outcome. It includes counseling, HIV testing, and administration of a 28-day course of medicines with follow-up. PEP should only be used for emergency situations and not as a substitution for regular use of other prevention methods. The UN AIDS have set an ambitious goal to help end the AIDS epidemic in countries worldwide, commonly known as the 95-95-95 targets. By 2030, 95% of people living with HIV will know of their HIV status, 95% of people diagnosed with HIV will be on antiretroviral therapy, and 95% of people on antiretroviral therapy will have achieved viral suppression. Unfortunately, there is no known cure yet. However, an effective regime of treatment called the Highly Active Antiretroviral Treatment or HEART could keep the infection at bay. The HEART targets the insides of the HIV virus and kills it. As the number of virus slowly drops, the viral load decreases too. The viral load is basically the amount of virus present in an infected individual. Now, don't get this confused with CD4 T cell levels. Once the viral load decreases to an undetectable level, which is the goal of antiretroviral therapy, HIV then becomes untransmitted. So let me repeat, heart brings the viral load down. When the viral load is undetectable, HIV is untransmittable. Remember, U equals to you. So, who should get tested? It is recommended that everyone between 13 to 64 years old get tested at least once because this is the only way to know if you are HIV infected. People who are at a higher risk should get themselves tested more often. Voluntary and confidential HIV tests can be found at almost all government hospitals and health clinics. An anonymous, quick and free HIV testing tool can be found in the Rapid HIV Test Kit, which is also a viable option. During the COVID-19 pandemic, if you are unable to visit a healthcare facility physically, you can also seek an online consultation. Before we end this video, do you think people living with HIV can live normal lives? Well, the answer is definitely yes. Antiretroviral treatment should be started as soon as possible and of course, with good compliance.
It is important for people living with HIV to live healthy, normal lives by exercising regularly, eating a healthy and balanced diet, as well as getting adequate rest. Not to forget, mental well-being is important too. People living with HIV can participate in HIV or AIDS support groups and take part in NGOs like the Kuala Lumpur AIDS Support Services Society or CLAS. So that's about it. We hope that you have learned a thing or two about HIV and AIDS. Remember, HIV is not the same as AIDS. HIV is a virus and AIDS is the disease. Protect yourself by remembering this mantra. Undetectable equals to undetectable. Thank you for watching. We hope that you have a great time ahead with Erase. Thank you, Iris and Flash at Team, for such a very informative video. Remember, if the virus is undetectable, it is untransmittable. You equals you. Ladies and gentlemen, let's proceed to the Kahoot session regarding the contents of the video. Our Kahoot games and prizes are only for those in Zoom webinar right now. We're sorry to say that those viewing from live stream are not eligible to win as it is for viewing purpose only. So, participants of day one, stand a chance to be the top five winners. I'd like to thank Nyonya Kain for sponsoring five e-vouchers worth 75 ringgit as an addition to the prizes of the top five winners. For your information, fifth place will win the 75 ringgit e-voucher sponsored by Nyonya Kain, as well as the fourth place. Third place will win 20 ringgit grab e-voucher plus the 75 ringgit e-voucher. Second place will win 30 ringgit grab e-voucher plus the 75 ringgit e-voucher. And first place will win 50 ringgit grab e-voucher plus the 75 ringgit e-voucher. You can join in by clicking the link that is shared in the chat.
Wow. Okay, this is quite simple. So okay. Okay, great job, great job. Next. Amusing seal. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, very good. Remember, you can't transmit AIDS through hugging, so you can give them a really big warm hug. Okay, next. Alamak, okay, Swift Goose is catching up, okay. Almost all got it correct. Good, good. Okay. Let's see who's catching up now. Oh, still swift goose. Okay. Next question. What is CD4? Okay, okay. Wow, still swift crystal. Good job. Okay, keep it up, keep it up. Stand more questions. Can they live a normal life? Yes! Of course, they can. And it's up to us to help them. <laughs> Is it available in Malaysia? <gasps> Rapid Panther, we've been a swift goose, but not to worry, we have another eight more questions. I've reminded this before entering the guard session. I hope everyone gets this correct. Okay, I guess there's a bit left. Okay, um, I don't know. <laughs> uh oh. Yes, you really listen to the view 
or really know about this, huh? The flying dragon. Okay, dragon. Keep it up. Okay, true or false question again. Oh dear, sadly, it's a false statement. It's not curable by H A A R T. Okay, next question. <laughs> Has the highest answer streak? Great. Yes, it is possible. Okay. This is not considered a common method of transmission. Very good, very good. Okay, let's see who's leading. So we have another like three more questions. Still flying dragon. Okay. Okay, people, I hope you know this. Yes, use a condom during sexual intercourse. Well, flying dragon, you have the highest ancestry of 13. And there's swift dragon. She's catching up. Great. Alama. Bye bye, Flying Dragon. Swift Goose back to number one. Okay. Last question. Now, that's the end of the session. I mean, the question. Let's see. Swift Dragon, third place. Second place, Cute Piranha. And first place goes to... 
on an ostrich. Okay, congratulations. Congratulations to top three winners. But I need to know the top five winners because there's five prizes here. Okay, can we have a look at the total list? Eh? Because we gotta know who's the top five winners. Okay, um. Okay. Mm, okay. I guess let's proceed. Congratulations to the top three winners. Actually, it's supposed to have five winners. So, kind attention could all... Um, let's go with the first three first. Could all three of you please raise your hands using the raise hand feature? Because we'll send the details of the prize. We'd like to have a get contact with you so that you can get grab your grab e-vouchers. Is anyone raising up their hands? Mm. I don't think anyone is raising up their hands. Can I have honest ostrich, whoever that is? Can you raise up your hand using the raise hand feature in this Zoom? Oh dear. Okay. Hmm. How about the second place? The cute piranha. And then the third place will be the swift dragon, right? Okay, I can see that the... Okay. My team has contacted them. Okay, great. So congratulations to the winners. Okay, once again, let's proceed to the next agenda. So, ladies and gentlemen, a soft reminder, kindly take note that tomorrow will be day two of ERACE 2020. The itinerary will be a workshop with a theme empowering the future of healthcare. Just so everybody knows, the participants in this workshop are medical students throughout Malaysia. Nevertheless, there will also be a live streaming for the first session on Facebook for public viewing. Another important reminder, our fundraising sales are still ongoing. Remember to place your order before 27th of December 2020 to get your items delivered on time. More details of the bundles that we offer can be found in our official accounts in Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Other than that, online crowdfunding is also still open. Click the link in our bio at our official accounts or scan the QR code to help us help them. It's not the size of the donation that matters. What matters is the outcome your donation produces. All proceeds generated by this nonprofit organization will be channeled towards the Infectious Disease Department of UMMC in our efforts to elevate the quality of life of patients living with HIV or AIDS. Ladies and gentlemen, let's move on to our main agenda of the day. With us today is Mr. Tan Chi Yang, a fourth year UM medical student as the moderator of our forum today. We're very pleased to have with us as well, Dr. Professor Dr. Adiba Kamaru Zaman to open the floor for our forum session together with our prestigious lineup of speakers. They are Associate Professor Dr. Raja Iskandar Shah Raja Azwa from Infectious Disease Department of UMMC, Dr. Hawi Lim Sin Hao from the Department of Social and Preventive Medicine of UMMC, Ms. Nisha Ayub, a transgender activist, Mr. Raymond Tai from PT Foundation, and last but not least, Mr. Ian Lam Thien Yin, a fourth year UM medical student, which will represent the youth in the forum. Our panelists is ready to give an insightful view on HIV and AIDS in the COVID-19 pandemic from their expertise. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dato Professor Dr. Adiba. 
Assalamualaikum and good morning everyone and uh, good morning Balkis, uh, Chiang and uh, my colleagues Iskandar, Hawi, Raymond, Nisha. Thank you for spending your Saturday morning with, with us and the medical students on this uh, amazing forum. I'm so pleased that uh, ERASE has stood the test of time and uh, continues to do fantastic work around World AIDS Day each year. And uh, in fact, you know, the, crisis, the COVID crisis has uh, opened up new possibilities with this uh, webinar that hopefully will reach to many, many more people. I was very pleased to, to watch the video that you had this morning uh, with all the, uh, it, it was a bit like a, um, a, a wedding message, something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue with uh, something old teaching everyone how to, use condoms and must use condoms and uh, the much more modern prevention messages with uh, U equals U and uh, PrEP. So Iskandar, aren't you proud of our medical students? Are we? Very up to date and uh, great messages, um, uh, great educational messages to, to the, the public and to other medical students. I was asked to speak um, a little bit this morning by uh, Abdullah <clears throat> on uh, the role of advocacy. And I think, you know, I, I, it sounds like I, I don't really need to speak for very long because you all are already doing a great job uh, in, in, advo in uh, advocacy around HIV AIDS. Um, but let me say that uh, having been involved in advocacy um, almost all my professional life, uh, it, it uh, is another dimension of being a health professional that is extremely fulfilling and, um, uh, well, extremely fulfilling. Um, and there are different levels of advocacy that all of you can get involved in. Of course, as medical students right now, uh, you all are focused on passing your exams, on gaining the knowledge and skills and professionalism and competency that would make you the best doctors um, that we can can help you with or can help uh, produce. Uh, but the other dimension to uh, being a health professional and providing the standard clinical uh, service is, is this role of advocacy. And if you, if you look at what roles you can play as a health advocate? I think there are three levels. Uh, number one is, of course, the direct advocate at the patient level. And uh, we have many examples on how you can do this to each and every patient in, in the ward or in the clinics. Um, you know, a, a patient in the ward who might need help uh, to find uh, a, a place to stay upon discharge, for instance. We sometimes have a lot of problems getting uh, suitable accommodation because, you know, the family shuns them. I'm, I'm talking about people living with HIV here specifically. Um, and you, as a, as a doctor or as a health advocate, could um, advocate for the patient at that direct patient level, uh, playing your role, as uh, the clinician speaking with um, social workers and, and uh, maybe community NGOs to look for a suitable place for the patient. So that's an example of a very important uh, role for you as a clinician, but you don't even realize it that by doing all of that, you're advocating for the health and well-being for the patient beyond just making them better from, say, um, the HIV and AIDS. The second example would be um, being a, an advocate at the practice level, at the, uh, uh, the hospital level. How can you improve the quality of uh, care that you provide to the patient, for instance? Uh, an example would be um, you know, uh, Prof. Iskandar, Prof. Farida and, and colleagues at UMMC uh, or were advocating, for instance, for a reduction in the cost of viral load uh, at UMMC. So that's an example of uh, advocacy at practice level to improve 
the care that we give the patients. So, you know, as doctors, you can't just sit back and uh, and be happy that you know your your patients are being charged. So you play that that advocacy role uh, to at the systems level to ensure that your patients. Uh, get uh, equitable price and, and cheaper price and if, if, if possible, no price at all to pay for tests and medicine. So that's uh, being an advocate at the systems level. And then of course, at the larger level, there's advocacy at the policy and national and global level. And uh, a good example would be um, the kinds of programs that uh, MAF and M MAC and, and uh, where we, um, uh, at the, the doctors at PPUM and uh, faculty, including myself and Iskandar and others, uh, are also lending our hand there. And, and one example would be the uh, MBCH program that we, we, we have been working on for some time to ensure that uh, insurance companies um, include HIV AIDS uh, in their insurance um, programs. Uh, at the moment, having HIV excludes uh, people living with HIV from uh, buying an insurance. Uh, another example, and it's something, again, that we need to continue to advocate for, is um, pre-employment testing for HIV, pre-university testing for HIV. So these are all examples of um, systems level or national level advocacy that I hope all of you, uh, once you graduate or even, even now, uh, you can play your roles as advocates. Um, and then on a day-to-day -day basis, I mean, you don't have to wait to, to do this, to be a, a, a doctor before you become advocates. So I've given you examples of the patient level um, systems, uh, practice level and systems level advocacy that once you graduate, you, you can play a, a much bigger role, bigger and direct role. But already today, you, you're playing your role as advocates to um, provide accurate messages. Stigma and discrimination in HIV arise from, well, multi-level multi uh, causes, but uh, one of the, uh, one of the main reasons uh, people fear, people living with HIV or fear <clears throat> those at risk of HIV is, of course, um, the inaccurate knowledge of how HIV is transmitted. So you guys are doing a great role of educating here and uh, uh, playing your roles as advocates. Um, the other is, of course, uh, the, the second reason for stigma and discrimination is um, the, uh, the, the, the stigma around uh, gender identity, sexual preferences, um, you know, people who use drugs. And so by, again, uh, speaking about it, um, being open about it, and, um, you know, Nisha, thank you very much for joining us in this forum. I think um, uh, studies have shown that get, you know, being exposed to uh, people with different um, backgrounds and different, um, you know, gender identity and sexual preferences are also very powerful um, acts to destigmatize and uh, reduce the levels of stigmatization and discrimination that um, that's currently uh, rife in this country. So. Uh, well done to the, the committee at ERASE for uh, tackling all these uh, difficult conversations uh, that we in Malaysia have. And um, I say it once again, I'm very, very proud of all of you uh, as medical students for, um, for doing this. And so, uh, you know, th those are some of the examples and, and I hope ERASE, uh, you know, you, you're doing a great job here, but I hope that the activities that you do uh, are not just confined to the month of December um, and will its day, your role as advocates um, hopefully will continue every day. Uh, talk about HIV, talk about it to your parents, talk about, you know, the, the risk, um, 
for HIV. Talk about the advances in HIV like you did today around uh, U equals U PrEP, um, the importance of treatment, the importance of testing, the goal to end AIDS globally. Um, slip it into your dinner conversation with your parents, with your friends, uh, with everyone. Uh, I think uh, that that uh, is an equally um, important and an impactful way to advocate uh, rather than just wait uh, each year for World AIDS Day. So I hope uh, today with the 91 participants that I can see on Zoom, all of you will take the challenge um, to, to become advocates in your own little way or in your own spaces um, and uh, help us educate uh, the general public, uh, people around you, families and friends on um, the you know the new knowledge around HIV, the ways we can prevent, the ways we can treat, which I think will go a long, long way in reducing the stigma and discrimination that surrounds HIV AIDS and um, people at risk and key populations uh, at risk from HIV. So with that, thank you very much for inviting me to um, address this forum this morning. As I said, super, super, uh, uh, managed and uh, put together and um, as your former dean I'm extremely proud of all of you so thank you all right thank you Prof. Fatiba thank you so much for the uh, amazing uh, opening for us right good morning everyone uh, thank you to Balkis for giving the chair and Prof. Adiba again for the opening. Thank you for being here with us on a Saturday morning. My name is Chi Yang. I'm a fourth year medical student in UM. In today's session, I will be moderating an amazing panel with uh, five panelists. So uh, allow me to introduce them. First up, we have Associate Professor Dr. Raja Iskandar Shah, Raja Azwa. He is a doctor from the Infectious Disease Department at the UMC with an interest in sexual health and HIV. He is currently the clinical lead for the HIV service at UM. His research interests include HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis among key populations. And he is also the ordinary secretary of the Malaysian AIDS Council and is on the board of trustees of the Malaysian AIDS Foundation. Pleasure to have you here with us, uh, Prof. Skanda. You can just wave so that uh, we'll know who are we are, because we have a lot of panelists here. Morning, everyone. Right. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Right. Next up, we have Mr. Raymond Tai joining us today as well. He is the Acting Chief Operation Officer at the PT Foundation, a community based nonprofit organization working with key affected populations on HIV and AIDS and STI sexually transmitted. Uh, infections, uh, advocacy, prevention, treatment, support, and care work. He has volunteered for PT Foundation for more than 20 years and has been working full-time with PT Foundation since 2007. Mr. Raymond, if you are here, would you like to wave to our audience? Hi, everyone. Hi, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Raymond. Next up, we have Ms. Nisha Ayub. She is the co-founder of Seed Malaysia and Justice for Sisters campaign, which is the first ever trans-led organization that champions the rights of the transgender community in Malaysia. She managed to open the first ever shelter for transgender women named Tea Home. She has been advocating for the rights of the transgender community in Malaysia and for the past 12 years. She has also been invited as one of the eight activists to have a meeting with President Obama in 2015. And in 2018, uh, Malaysian uh, marine ecologists discovered a new species, a new genus, and named one of its species after her. She was given recognition by the Marie Claire as one of the there are 25 amazing women and as the only Malaysian on the BBC 100 women women of 2019. 
Ms. Nisha, would you like to say a few words to our audience? Hi, good morning, everyone. Morning. Thank you, Ms. Nisha. Next up, we have Dr. Howie. Uh, Dr. Sin Hao Lim is a senior lecturer from the Department of Social and Preventive Medicine from our own faculty, uh, Faculty of Medicine, UM. He is the lead investigator of social science research at Cheria, our Center of Excellence for Research in AIDS. Uh, Dr. Lim's research interests include social determinants of health, the disparities among vulnerable populations, and developing interventions to reduce the health disparities. His past research focused on substance use, sexual risk behaviors among men who have sex with men, MSM, barriers, and uh, to ex access HIV prevention and treatment among MSM. Dr. Howie, would yeah, you like hi, to wave to our audience? Thank you, Dr. Howie. Last but not least, we have a colleague of my own, uh, Mr. Ian Lang. Is uh, also a fourth-year medical student from uh, our own faculty. He was he's the president of uh, Malaysian Medics International Young Medics back in 2017 and 2018, where he collaborated with uh, Malaysian medical students nationwide and outside of Malaysia to host events to support pre-university students with questions on uh, medical school admission and medicine as a career. He also served as the head of the academic program during the Asian Collaborative Training on Infectious Disease Outbreaks, Natural Disasters and Refugee Management held in 2019, which hosted medical students across Asia uh, in our own faculty. Currently, he's involved in a community nutrition, counseling and food relief project at Program Purumahan Rakyat PPR Lembah Subang under the Department of Pediatrics uh, of our UMMC. Ian is a fourth year student, same as me. So Ian, hi. Good morning. Hi. Hi, everyone. <laughs> right. Yeah. So without further ado, after this short introduction of our panelists, we are honoured again to have a panel that I would say it's quite a diverse panel. I thank all the panelists for uh, being able to be here with us today. In today's session, we will look into stigma and discrimination towards people living with HIV, the impact of COVID-19 on people living with HIV, an effort to end AIDS by 2030 from the perspectives of our panelists. We will also touch on the issues, as Prof. Adiba put it, that are difficult to be discussed, but has to be discussed. We are just get ready, everyone. We are going to hear from uh, some really amazing panelists. So before, just right before we start today's session, I'm trying to share my screen. Just a few housekeeping rules is that uh, we remind everyone to be respectful at all times. We encourage everyone uh, to participate actively by typing questions in the Q&A sections. Now, that is not to be confused with the uh, comment section. There are two different sections in Zoom. So the last one would be there are two forms, uh, the baseline assessment and the evaluation and feedback form uh, prepared to help us improve uh, we would really appreciate it if you can fill it up. All right, with that, I think it is time for me to kick off the forum by going into the first topic of today. So, stigma and discrimination uh, to, towards people living with HIV, as Prof. Adiba put it, it's sort of the Achilles heel of uh, HIV response. So, allow me to just briefly touch on for for the audience out there, allow me to just briefly touch on what is uh, stigma, just a little bit of background information. So it is a form of prejudice, neg negative attitudes, discrimination, abuse directed at a particular group of people, and it's based on their distinguishing characteristics, such as health conditions, disabilities, gender, sexuality, religion, culture, race, etc. And it can be overt, overt versus subtle. So in overt stigma, we are looking at uh, people who are very upfront about their negative feelings, their discrimination towards a particular group of people, whereas some people would prefer to be more subtle on that. Right. So with some background information on stigma and discrimination, first up, I would like to 
kick off, open this discussion uh, on stigma and discrimination, I would like to uh, direct this question to Ian, which is a fourth year medical student. Uh, Ian, so as a medical student, uh, are you taught or exposed to the experiences or the difficulties uh, that the people who are living with HIV or the marginalized community uh, might experience? Hi, yes. Um, yes. So, uh, in regards to that question, uh, in our curriculum in uh, UM, yes, we do have exposure to um, what is that? people living with HIV back in our preclinical years, whereby uh, we, like, there were people living with HIV who actually came to talk to us about their experience with the disease itself, their issues in the community, and also like, uh, and also like the um, their their whole their whole experience, so and so, so forth. And then also in clinical years, we do go into the wards and uh, we enter the infectious diseases ward where we interact with HIV patients as well. However, I would say that that's more on a it's more of a disease perspective when we enter the ward. Uh, we sell, we have less of a discussion in regards to their issues in the community or the stigma that they face. So, like, the preclinical years really opened my eyes to that. And I think it was, uh, so, like, my thoughts about it was that it's actually, I thought it was super cool because that uh, it definitely puts a very human aspect on whatever we're learning. Uh, and we see firsthand the impact of how we approach such patients in the long run. So, it's, like, and the importance of our attitude in building, like, positive uh, doctor-patient relationships going forward. Also, it, also like, touching on what Prof. Adiba uh, mentioned just now, that uh, something called the contact hypothesis, which is that when there is an expo when there is a when there is first contact between like one group with another, it there's like research that shows that uh, it reduces it destigmatizes that group because suddenly we're open to it suddenly puts the human aspect and it it puts the group that you don't know about right in front of your face, and it, yeah, okay. Right, thank you, Ian. So just a follow-up on that is that uh, thank you for sharing your perspectives and your thoughts about it. Just uh, we understand that you are unable to represent the whole community. That would be unfair. Just that uh, generally, what is the opinion of your peers regarding the marginalized community and people living with HIV, just generally? Okay, well, in regards to the marginalized community, from what I understand is that uh, the definition is very wide. So when we're talking about marginalized community, uh, it, I just want to clarify, uh, do you talk, are, you, are we talking about HIV patients only or are we talking about like people who like inject drugs or uh, the LGBT community in Malaysia as well? Yep, all together. All together. Because like, I would say that every single marginalized community has its own issues and it warrants its own discussion. We can't really go into that uh, too detailed at this moment. So, in regards to peers, uh, I'll focus on the HIV community first. So, in regards to my peers, I would say that I actually thought that because I, because me and Chiang, both of us are from the medical community, we actually, I actually thought that like the stigma and discrimination would be less amongst the, um, like the medical peer group. But I've actually read research recently. Uh, this is conducted in pop, like across the public institutions in Malaysia uh, on medical students and dental students. Uh, and it actually found that stigma, like they actually had a more negative attitude to men who have sex with men or intravenous drug users in, as, as compared to like general patients as a whole. This is medical students and uh, dental students. So I was a bit, I mean, like a bit surprised with that, to be honest. Uh, however, and then also I was talking to a friend of a friend from the Islamic faculty to kind of hear his opinions on HIV because about two years ago, uh, I think erased there was like a bit of a there was a bit of a, uh, a what is it called controversy in regards to the distribution of condoms. So I really wanted to hear like that uh, the, the opposite opinion of uh, or look more into this issue. Or and so what he mentioned I thought was very fascinating is that in Islam, or he mentioned that they are taught about how HIV is transmitted, what causes it but not really enough about how to interact with people living with HIV, which does lead to stigma. He actually agreed with me that uh, amongst people who, who uh, have Islamic beliefs, there is a higher chance that they have stigma towards uh, people living with HIV 
but the, the most, I think like the best thing, uh, the most positive thing that came out of that discussion is that it, we're open to, most of the youth are open to uh, reducing the stigma amongst the HIV community. It's just that I think most importantly, we need to keep an open mind. And at the same time, uh, a lot of people are still, we've never been exposed to any education on HIV and that kind of leads to a false perception of the issue out there. So yes, stigma still does exist even amongst the youth. Yeah. Thank you, Ian. It's always a work in progress. Thank you for sharing that to us. Next, we'd like to ask uh, Mr. Raymond. So, being so involved in a community-based organization, what are the negative experiences that people living with HIV experience in the community? Hi, and uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen here? Let me put it on slide. Can you see my screen? Yes. Great. Not yet, Mr. Raymond. No? Not yet. Uh, what am I not doing right? Can you share from your end, uh, moderator? Press. Okay, go to the second slide. We, we can see the okay, so, now. Yeah, so I, I, I just sort of drawn out there. I think just to emphasize what Ian was mentioning, uh, if you're talking about people living with HIV, uh, because in Malaysia, it's such a concentrated epidemic among key populations. So most people's uh, perception about people that live, live in HIV falls into these uh, four categories there, which are injecting drug users, men who have sex with men, transgender, and not forgetting that all these categories have partners. Uh, sometimes they are wives, sometimes they are uh, uh, lovers. Uh, and then there are sex workers as well, who are very uh, hidden because they don't disclose themselves. And of course, if you're talking about sex workers and uh, money boys, all that is, you have clients as well. So all these populations are what we, we are facing, what we call double stigma on, uh, on, on. So it's not just about the HIV that they're facing, but how they get infected or who they are as a person or, or, or how, how, they, how, they build, how they live their lives, right? So if you look from that one, let's look at the next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, the moment one is diagnosed as a PLHIV, it goes through a, a, a lot of different stages. Uh, so first thing, of course, is the emotional turmoil of, uh, dealing with HIV and the emotional turmoil deal with as things like anger, depression, uh, uh, suicidal thoughts, everything. So it takes a long time before somebody uh, gets comfortable about even accepting themselves as PLHIV. So there is a subject matter of denial and some people can be in denial for months or years and that actually leads to a decline in their health because it brings them to AIDS faster. Uh, the stereotypes that are formed about people living in HIV in these communities as well uh, is very stigmatizing. So if you are an MSM who do not, so the public perception of an MSM could be that like they, they, they are sissy and everything and you, you're not. So the, the stereotypes actually create more stigma. Uh, Non-acceptance is, uh, uh, non-acceptance in this is both ways. Huh? So it's not acceptance from the uh, public health and society of them, as well as uh, the internalized stigma that they feel that create themselves not, not being accepted as well. Uh, so these four things are very much hidden, the, the first four categories, emotion, turmoil, denial, stereotypes, and non-acceptance. Uh, what in Malaysia, what we're getting quite good at is addressing 
the treatment aspects of it, which is uh, ARV treatment. Uh, and, but unfortunately, ARV comes with side effects as well, and it affects different people different, differently. And that could lead to a lot of stigma as well. Uh, in, and as, you, as someone is taking ARV longer than, uh, say, five to 10 years, there is such a thing called ARV fatigue, pill fatigue. So uh, they may stop taking HIV uh, drugs, medication, and that could lead to severe problems. So uh, we, we are really encountering among uh, uh, el more, more elderly uh, or, or people been taking uh, ARV for a longer time, they, they come into fatigue problems. Uh, and of course in Malaysia, although we are very fortunate that drugs are provided for free, uh, cost is still a big issue uh, for, for many because uh, those who are migrants, those who are students, even the cost of transportation to skip up your appointments, they, they add up, yeah? So I, th I think if you're talking about negative experiences, it, it's varied and it depends on, on which category you fall in as well. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Raymond. Thank you for sharing us that. Uh, Ms. Nisha, we would like to also hear from you. What's your perspective on this? What are the negative experiences that might have been experienced? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for inviting me for this forum. Yeah. Uh, so in regards of the experience when it comes to transgender community specifically, yeah. Uh, firstly, we need, we need to acknowledge that trans people are not recognized legally here in the country, right? Uh, therefore, when a community is not recognized legally in regards of their gender identity and expression, automatically they become uh, denied of every part or every um, services or access, whether it's towards health or whatsoever, in related with uh, their issues needs and their concerns. So uh, when you talk about the transgender community in Malaysia, I would say uh, we have been constantly targeted and constantly being uh, discriminated. Uh, and this is due to the, uh, you know, the, the stereotyping, the uh, uh, statements uh, by certain leaders out there that portrays a very negative uh, impression towards the community, you know, uh, such as, you know, uh, we, are, we are basically having mental issue, we are, we are not a part of the society, we are not a part of the Malaysian culture, and not just that, uh, there's, there's been strongly um, uh, enforcing of uh, corrective approach being done towards the transgender community, uh, and this is related to religion. And due to this, uh, I would say eventually people would have to agree with me, right? Because of our visibility being transgender people, we are constantly being discriminated in so many levels. And this is just not about uh, the health perspective issue, but at the same time to actually access to all those, uh, uh, what do you call this, um, services being provided here, right? And uh, in, in within the, 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 the transgender community itself, right, uh, a lot of them feel that they are not a part of the system and they are not entitled to actually access to all those, uh, uh, what you call this, uh, uh, rights that, that, that they're supposed to, right, as a Malaysian citizen. And a lot of them would not, would not, want to actually uh, face or actually go forward uh, when it comes to their health issues because they are so fear that, you know, since they are being uh, easily uh, discriminated, again, because of our visibility, uh, I would say our visibility can also be our, our strength, but at the same time, it can also be our downfall because uh, the visibility actually opens to a lot of discrimination that is very direct, right? So um, sadly, uh, the situation here in Malaysia towards the transgender community has been, has been going downfall, I must say, uh, compared to 
Previously, uh, before the 80s, where transgender people are recognized from the medical field and transgender people are actually given their rights to their health, right? And, and at that time, you don't hear the issue of LGBT issue being discriminated. You don't hear the issue of transgender being targeted in social media or in the news and so on, or in the mainstream media, right? But sadly, because we are not, uh, or, or we are being denied of our gender identity, and there are laws, yeah, I repeat, there are laws against transgender people. Therefore, that actually derails towards high stigma and discrimination towards the community. Oh, just uh, uh, with that, I really cannot imagine the lives and the experience that uh, the transgender community has to go through in order just to live, try to live a normal life like the rest of the people. So thank you again, Ms. Nisha, for sharing that. It's valuable to us. Thank you. Right. So with that, I think we now roughly have a, an idea and also our panelists have shared on the ground experience and about stigma and discrimination and how is it occurring in the current landscape. So with that, we would like to explore further to the challenges faced in the COVID-19 pandemic. So this COVID-19 pandemic sends us into a new norm. It brings new challenges and it levels up the existing challenges to all layers of our community. We have seen some of the social and financial impacts of COVID-19 and it is indeed a challenging time for everyone. So the next question I would like to post it to uh, Mr. Ian on, we're interested to know how does COVID-19 affect youth, the youth population and studies, social life, support, mental health? <laughs> yes, hello. So, yes, uh, in regards to, so let's talk about studies first. Uh, for the, for most of my peers in University Malaya, I understand that they've been doing online classes uh, for like, they're still doing online classes, but, and also the for the medical fraternity, uh, all of our classes have been shifted online. Uh, definitely it's impacted our learning in that way. I would say there's pros and cons. Uh, it's good for adaptation. Moving into 21st century, it's high time that uh, some, it's like institutions adopted new learning technologies as well. Give some breathing space, but some cons would be uh, there's, certain, there's certain aspects of uh, things that we can't really apply to the online, uh, on, to the online platform. <laughs> But, okay, in regards to social life, it's affected, but I don't think it's that bad because, like, the youth always, we have social, we are, we're the generation of social media, so we still keep in touch with that. I don't think it's a big issue, per se. Uh, but mental health, mental health-wise, I would say that um, this, uh, I think personally, from what I know, some of my peers, or some of my friends that uh, during the MCO period, they spend, like, a prolonged time with their family for the first time since uh, leaving home, I would say that it's cropped up certain mental issues as well. Um, some family problems. Another another thing that I think a lot of uh, youth are worried about would be future job prospects. Some of, like, I'm at the age that some of my friends have just entered the job market and in Malaysia and it's quite bleak for certain industries at the moment. So there's a lot of uh, anxiety towards that uh, as well going forward with COVID-19. Yeah. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Right, so if we go back a little bit on what Ms. Nisha shared to us earlier is all the constant uh, discrimination and there are even law against the community and uh, the marginalized community being not part of, not accepted as part of Malaysia's culture and all our leaders portraying, all our leaders portraying uh, that all these messages that they are send, sending to uh, the Malaysians is that uh, the stigma and discrimination is real. And Prof. Adiba did mention earlier about the challenges that people living with HIV face in terms of accommodation. Now, the impacts of the pandemic hit everyone at some level, right? But we know that it hits everyone differently and some communities may be hit harder. So, we'd like to pose this question to 
both Mr. Raymond as, and Ms. Nisha, what are the challenges faced by uh, people living with HIV and also the transgender community in the pandemic? How is it different previously comparing pre-COVID and post-COVID? Mr. Raymond, if you want to go first, please. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll try to share my slide again, my screen. Uh, we can see it. You can? Yep, uh, our team has helped you to share. Okay, cool. So, uh, I think if you look at uh, what Ian has mentioned, uh, a lot of those factors face people living HIV as well, but uh, it is amplified uh, because they are dealing with so many issues before, now they're dealing with more issues because of COVID and the pandemic. So the whole issue about isolation, uh, especially in urban cities, even in rural areas, a lot of uh, PLHIV are living alone uh, in apartments, or if they're living with the families, the families do not know about the status. So that uh, feeling of isolation is amplified during the time, especially if there's a lockdown or, or movement restriction and if you uh, uh, say you're already out but your your parents or your family has not reconciled or your wives are not reconciled to your status as a PLHIV or as a, as a gay man uh, the family stress is enormous uh, so we're having a lot of young adults young gay men who are facing tremendous stress while living at home with their families uh, uh, and those who are living in isolation, they face issues that are loneliness and all that. So all that is leading to uh, them switching to the internet for source of uh, uh, other things to substitute the isolation. And that's where we we see uh, during the outreach that we do that dating apps are gone huge. <laughs> amount of people are on, on on dating apps now, and obviously a lot of people are on dating apps for sexual purposes, also a lot more sexual hookups being done. Uh, and that some a lot of that sex is uh, unprotected sex, not using condom or PrEP. So that is tremendous risk, risk of transmission of HIV. Uh, and drugs, of course, uh, especially among young people today, uh, drugs, especially uh, recreational drugs, like meth and shabu, all that, uh, being taken more uh, because of the isolation that they, fa they face. And when they compare sex and drugs together, uh, especially in the gay community, we have what is called chem fun or chem sex. And that is uh, the, and you, you, using, the, using drugs like meth or shabu ice for the purpose of uh, enhancing their sexual activities. And when you combine that, we find that that is uh, we, we don't have proper data, but I think that is now the number one cause of why uh, gay men are getting themselves uh, exposed to HIV. Because when you are having chem sex uh, under the influence of drugs, a lot of protection goes out of the window and you're more at risk of getting the HIV that way. Uh, the, the access to... What is this one here? Uh, the access to ARV... Uh, can also be affected, especially if you live in rural areas. There's a long time in terms of traveling, or sometimes your, your your clinic that you go to is in Kuala Lumpur, but you come back to your hometown and you cannot travel. So ARV is access is, is uh, restricted, and we have to make other alternative arrangements for that. If you're a foreigner, it uh, it is most foreigners are getting a supply by flying to either Bangkok or the Philippines or uh, getting it couriered to them. That is totally affected at the moment. So it has led to uh, people who have been treatment cannot get, get, get their, 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 their supply of uh, treatment at the moment. So support networks drop. We, we run a support group session for people living with HIV. We have a uh, narcotics anonymous group. All of that stopped because of the, uh, the, the pandemic restrictions. And not forgetting job loss. Uh, a lot of freelancers, especially and a lot of companies are retrenching people. Uh, so reduced income, job loss can lead to a lack of self-esteem and of course, uh, purchasing power kind of thing. So all of that will combine to enhance or magnify their mental health facing some of the HIV positive. So we are actually worried that because of the mental health issues that they face, 
we might see uh, a, a decline in uh, adhering to treatment. So we're watching out and discussing with our doctors and trying to reach out a lot more to these people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Raymond. We can definitely see that uh, through, through isolation, uh, the reduction for excess and increase in high-risk activities, uh, loss of job security, all amplifies the challenges that uh, people living with HIV are really facing. Next, we would like to also hear from uh, Ms. Nisha. What are your perspectives on this? Uh, thank you. Um, in regards of the COVID pandemic, yes, it has actually impacted everyone, right? In regards of their race, gender, and so on. Um, but when it comes to the transgender community, I must say um, I was actually extreme sh extremely shocked because uh, when the MCO started here in Malaysia, um, all of a sudden I had requests from uh, transgender people all around Malaysia including Sabah, Sarawak, Semporna, and so on, right? And the numbers of requests uh, shocked me because, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, when it comes to transgender people, for them to access whatever aid being given is so difficult, right? And uh, as as most people would, would, would stereotype transgender people being sex workers, which I don't blame them because I would say the population of transgender people in Malaysia would go to 60 to 70 percent of transgender people being involved in sex work. Why? It's because they're being pushed away to that uh, situation just to you know live their life, right? And um, so when you know when you are sex workers, when you are all alone by yourself out there, and all of a sudden MCO starts, what happened? You don't have any income anymore. You don't have family support anymore, and you end up on the street being homeless. And this is a thing that uh, that that actually happened uh, when the pandemic actually started and then uh, we started to fundraise and we managed to raise around 40,000 ringgit Malaysia to actually assist groceries aid and that's just for groceries. We have cases of, of trans people who have been abandoned uh, from their home and at the same time um, as we in Seed Malaysia we also have our first ever transgender uh, home and we had a request from young transgender people. Why? It's because there are cases of them actually losing their job and then they are forced to go back to their parents and then all of a sudden their parents or their families started, you know, wanted to them to change. And then they feel mental, uh, they, they face mental abuse by their own family, ending up looking for assistance from us. And we now we have an increase of youth trans people actually staying temporarily at our shelter. Right. And, um, you know, when you talk about aid itself, right, uh, people nowadays are so excited to talk about KWSP, right, and so on, because they are, they're getting some kind of assistance. But when it comes to transgender people, how many transgender people are employed? Right? How many of them have insurance? How many of them have, have contribution to, the, to uh, the, the, the EPF and so on? They do not have those aid. And how many of them actually can have this access to actually go to social welfare? and seek assistance. No, they don't. So it has impacted them tremendously. And I fear that there's going to be more trans people on the street uh, because of this, uh, you know, constantly being pushed away from the system itself because of our gender identity. Thank you, Ms. Nisha. Thank you for sharing that. Indeed, we need to... One thing I think we need to acknowledge here and it's important is that Ms. Nisha mentioned that 60 to 70% of uh, transgender are pushed, I emphasize the word push, into sex work. They are not. It's different. We need to understand that they are pushed. They are doing that because they have no other ways to find a living. They also need to survive. And exacerbated by the lack of access to social support and uh, social security services, so we can only, at, at this panel, we can only, uh, at this uh, session today, we can only imagine the difficulties of people, both people living with HIV and the transgender community, how they are, how, how was it challenging for them before the COVID 
and how has COVID actually amplified the challenges and the difficulties that they face. Thank you again to uh, Ms. Nisha and Mr. Raymond for sharing that to us. Right. Our next topic for discussion is how does uh, HIV stigma actually affect our the treatment response? So I would like to take some time here to share a little bit of background information is that a study is conducted to evaluate the impact of the social demographic and stigma related constructs to have what, what do these two things have on the physicians doctors intention to discriminate against people living with HIV. So the findings from this study suggest that uh, social demographic factors uh, does not play so much of a role uh, but physicians in certain specialties express greater discriminations, intend to discriminate, and stigma-related construct play a larger role in the doctor's intention to discriminate. So specifically, what is also reported is that doctors who reported more negative attitudes towards people who are living with HIV, greater feelings of HIV-related shame, greater fear of HIV and less agreement that uh, people with PRHIV deserve uh, quality medical care. All of those factors combined together, doctors who feel this are expressing greater intention to uh, discriminate against people with PRHIV. So uh, the purpose of me showing this paper, this study here is just to show to our audience that it's a real thing. It is this stigma and discrimination and how it affects the treatment response. It is not something that we are, it, we are worrying that it might happen in the future. It's not something like that. It is something that is happening, very happening currently at the moment. Right. So let's kick off this topic by uh, posting. We'd like to hear on the, what are the negative experiences from uh, receiving care and seeking care from uh, Mr. Raymond and also uh, Ms. Nisha. So, Mr. Okay. Raymond, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, yeah, can we go to the slides again, please? So, I just, next one. Next one. Can you move to the next one? Sorry, sorry, let's go back to topic three. Topic three, yeah, okay. Um, so stigma affects, again, that there are different ways that it, it affects uh, response uh, and, and treatment. Uh, I mentioned some of them just now already, but, but just to run through. I think the first thing to recognize though is that in Malaysia, we are more fortunate than many other uh, third world or, or Asian countries in the sense that our, our treatment is free, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, some kind of universal access uh, exists. Uh, so we got free drugs, free treatment, and free HIV tests. Uh, so we have been able to get many of the community to get tested at government clinics because it's offered for free. And the Ministry of Health has set up uh, uh, more than 50 clinics around the country, which are considered as dedicated community-friendly clinics. Uh, whereby the staff uh, and, and, and uh, the entire staff are trained to be sensitive and um, reduce the stigma and discriminations against uh, people living HIV and the communities that they come from. Uh, so we have experienced uh, very good feedback from these community clinics. Unfortunately, there are, uh, uh, I think, more than 2,000 clinics around the country and not all of them are well trained and people do move around. So um, you're going to get varying standards of stigma discrimination depending on where you go. But even in, uh, let's say, clinical setting Kuala Lumpur, whereby uh, we have very good doctors and, and counselors and nurses there. But the uh, when, when a person approached the clinic, it's more than just the, the infectious disease unit that they go to. They first come to the front counter 
and then they they go to other departments as well if there are other associated tests that they do and that's where a lot of the stigma exists uh, because the entire hospital is not trained uh, we have had people who come for a test and they get looked at in a certain way or the, the, the front counter staff will say you are a young man you're not married why you want to do a hiv test uh you've been committing sin is that right uh so it's blatant as that so that really turns people off uh so so we we, we need the entire healthcare provider industry train but more than that stigma happens ar around us as well so really it's an entire country, country all, all malaysians need to be sensitized in that area um this is so i i've listed here i think uh nisha would extend on that uh within the communities the key populations that we, we work with the more marginalized you are the more challenges that you would face so uh if you're transgender you're visible uh you face a lot more challenges a lot more stigma whereas for many uh other plhiv via msm uh many actually choose to because you you cannot tell who is msm so they do not disclose that part of it when they get when they go for a hiv test or even when they're on treatment stage they they hide that aspect from their medical file which actually can be quite uh, uh disadvantage right because if you're not telling your doctor everything that the doctor needs to know they're not going to be able to treat you accordingly so for example if you present yourself you want to go for sti check uh, and the doctor look at it and say, oh, this looks like a, 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 on the file, you look at you're, you're a married man with a wife and family. They would not do an STI check for you around the anal region, for example. So uh, it is on the onus of the patient to disclose information like that. But many uh, MSM choose not to because they face a lot of internalized stigma. And they don't know what's going to happen if they do that. So, so, so they don't. Uh, there is the the other aspect is our ARV uh, is freely available at least our first line, but uh, we have not caught up with the latest treatment uh, available today uh, in 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 US or in Australia. All that they have moved to more advanced drugs, but because these drugs are patented, patented, they they cost a lot more, so they are not provided for. So we we're not getting the best in HIV medication at the moment. Uh, and lastly, of course, uh, location and cost uh, are major problems for a lot of people as well, although the, the, the medication that is free, uh, we, we have, have problems, uh, especially from people in the East Coast states, uh, from rural areas, uh, in terms of going following up the treatments on a regular basis. So if you're on HIV, you get your medicals, your, your drugs on a monthly basis, and you need to follow up on medical consultations on every, every few months. So some of them have dropped up as a result, even as a restriction as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Raymond. Ms. Nisha, do you have anything to add up? Would you like to add on that? Yes, please. About, uh, yes. Just, yeah. Just a short one. Um, I just want to share because uh, the question was uh, negative experience receiving uh, treatment care in hospitals, right? Uh, a recent case that I actually uh, counter just recently was a transgender woman in, in Johor Bahru. She was admitted in hospital, Melbourne Hospital. Uh, it, it, it really saddened me because uh, she was such in a depressed situation where she had to go for further surgery and so on. However, again, visibility and being a transgender person, she was being treated very badly by health providers there, right? Um, she was not just being mocked or laughed at, but she was also being uh, taught about, you know, for you to repent, you know, religion is being used in the health sector, which I'm totally against it because I believe uh, that as health providers, we need to be professional uh, in, in regards of, you know, the healthcare or the well-being of your patient. However, when she was there, she was subjected in regards of, you know, it's time for you to repent. Why are you being this? Why are you being that? You know, be a man and so on. And uh, I had to bring this matter uh, to, 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 a, to a higher level uh, whereby we, re we reported this case 
And thank God, uh, this is a positive side. We still have health providers, which is very, very, uh, what do you call this, open and also empathy towards the, the, the community. And automatically, we had uh, certain uh, uh, enforcers uh, uh, in the hospital actually took, took charge of the complaint. And she was basically now being settled down, right? And uh, based on what Raymond mentioned again, right, um, because of our visibility, a lot of us do not want to go for treatment because we are afraid. You know, as soon as we start, that's not for treatment, but as soon as we start in the registration part, we are being discriminated, we are being laughed, we are being mocked at. And our gender identity become, become, become an issue rather than the, the healthcare services that we needed, right? And um, at the same time, as I mentioned uh, earlier on, there are doctors out there and things are getting positively uh, in, in, in Kuala Lumpur. I mean, for instance, we have the uh, clinic set in Kuala Lumpur where we have Dr. Nurul. She's amazing. And the community loves her and the community adores her that they eventually wants to go for treatment when it comes to whatever issue, if, even though it's related with HIV AIDS. Thank you. So we see the importance of having, making uh, not just enough, having the uh, infrastructures and the healthcare systems services, but it has to be accessible by people of all, from all walks of life. So uh, next, I would like to uh, ask Mr. Uh, Ian. We all know that uh, as uh, medical students, future health professionals, there's this thing that we are very familiar with. It's called the Hippocratic Oath. And it sort of, it's one of the a very old document. It has been revised from time to time and it, it contains some of the ethics and the good practices that uh, we should uphold as uh, healthcare prov providers. So how do you feel that the oath uh, impact your role as a medical student who is going to be a doctor in the future in treating patients uh, PL with uh, who are PLHIV. Hi, yes. So thanks, Shia. Uh, I think in regards to Hippocratic Oath, my understanding is it's like it focuses a lot on teaching us that to do no harm. It's a very ancient document dating back to the Greeks. Perhaps like how it relates to this topic in particular would be that it's about the importance of setting aside uh, our personal beliefs for the greater good of our patient's health. Uh, that yeah that's the most important thing and i'm actually very shocked that uh, uh after what uh miss nisha you mentioned about the experience of transgenders in yeah even in the more even in like kuala lumpur the health setting i'm very very shocked that this is still occurring and it's definitely something for uh medical students like us to reflect on so in regards to what can we do to improve this like for medical students in the future i think that it's most important that for us like public engagement or even dialogue uh, debating and discussing with people that share different views from us uh, with other youth that we disagree with i think we don't really have that a lot nowadays it's more of like it's more of like an echo chamber we always we talk more to people that we agree with and we go oh yeah i mean like yeah i have the same feeling but how often do we actually talk to let's say if let's say i have a more liberal perspective on this issue how often do we approach someone who is more conservative, who has a different opinion on this, or yeah, and actually have a debate, have an honest debate about about what they what they think and what we think, and let and like let the and come to a conclusion, come to mutual respect, and also like uh, kind of uh, gain new perspectives on both sides of the party. Because if if we if we claim ourselves to be open minded, uh, but when we uh, hear views like maybe more conservative views that uh, we disagree with like a lot of us quickly jump to the conclusion that they are wrong so how open-minded are we actually then <laughs> um so yeah it's debate discussion uh having honest honest uh honest and constructive disagreement with people we have different views on and also other things like uh, that can be done to improve medical education, to improve empathy would be uh, like, I think what UMA is doing at the moment is that we have uh, exposure to these uh, marginalized or vulnerable communities uh, that we actually have, we actually meet them and talk to them and listen to their uh, opinions and views and their issues that they face. Uh, 
which which is like what Iris is doing, which is amazing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. So we can really see that this is still a, still an issue despite the many efforts that have been tried, uh, that have been put in to tr to try to reduce the discrimination stigma in order to maximize the uh, treatment response. So next, we would like to hear from the uh, healthcare settings. We would like to hear from Prof. Uh, Rajesh Ganda on. Prof, can you give us some uh, examples or experiences of stigmas that your patients who might have faced who are uh, PLHIV, who might have uh, experience in the healthcare settings? Finally, I've been waiting for so long. <laughs> but nevertheless, listen, I just want to say before that, I'll answer your question. I was supposed to wear this shirt. Um, so, uh, and I think all of us were supposed to wear this shirt. Uh, some of us didn't wear it because we ordered uh, an undersized shirt and um, we've gained a bit of weight during the MCO. So uh, just to explain why I'm not wearing that shirt, whilst 50% uh, of you on this um, are wearing. So I apologize for that first. Um, I think, and secondly, to your question, and please, please buy the shirts because it donates, it gets it donated to the Infectious Disease Unit. Okay, sorry, I had to throw that in as a plug-in um, and it, it all proceeds go to um, funding uh, blood tests uh, and, and, and medications for people living with HIV who come to UNMC. Um, stigmatizing experiences uh, uh, experienced by people living with HIV in um, the hospital setting. Um, so I think the successes of a unit looking after people living with HIV largely relate to sensitization. Um, and visibility. So if you are sensitized enough to a particular uh, marginalized population, you will uh, un un undoubtedly or eventually treat them in the way that they deserve to be treated. So just to, just to emphasize that point, sensitization is so important, okay? So continual exposure to a particular marginalized population. So I think I think visibility has more advantages than disadvantages um, from a healthcare perspective uh, to, to any key population. Secondly, um, I, I think you wanted some examples of stigmatizing um, experiences. So I think some things in the hospital that maybe that we as healthcare providers initially did very badly in, in our setting was well, when you came to the ID unit maybe 10 years ago, only doctors could take um, bloods from people living with HIV. The nurses at the time probably uh, were allowed not to. And, and whereas all other patients, um, uh, 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 you know, nurses could take it. And it took us a couple of years before we changed that practice. And that was clearly, to, in my opinion, stigmatizing behavior, which should have been addressed very much earlier. There's no reason why nurses could have not taken it on very much earlier. It's just, you know, I think a lot of people just want reassurance around safety uh, and that can be provided very easily with evidence. Um, so the other issues is as uh, you know, people requesting CT scans, uh, people living with HIV requesting CT scans were often put last on the list. People living with HIV um, who are undergoing surgery were always put last on the list. And there was no clear reason why that was happening, um, apart from a possible fear of contamination of operating theatres or equipment, uh, which was very, very, very unlikely. Um, uh, you know, so it just, it fears elevate other people's fears and it, 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 it results in uh, non-evidence-based policies which do not get changed over time. And so we need to address that uh, as, as, as a goal, um, uh, outdated and non-evidence policies as evidence emerges. When patients are discriminated, I think you will always find a group of healthcare providers who will be on your side. You know, I think, I think there is, uh, I think compassion, empathy always um, outrule, um, um, you know, stigmatizing minds. I think as, as healthcare providers, particularly in infectious diseases, we become better human beings because we learn to treat people how they should be treated. And I think um, 
you know, I think uh, as a rule, you should be able to find healthcare providers within the, less, within the healthcare industry who will be able to do exactly that. And then, although human rights is not always the best issue to argue in terms of in, in, in a setting like Malaysia, but I, I think key populations need to know their rights and, 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 and voice them out and call out against healthcare providers who do not treat them in the way that they're meant to be treated. That's quite clear. You know, we all have a right to health, irrespective of who we are. And if um, a healthcare worker is not providing that, then something is wrong along the way. Um, from a healthcare perspective, a lot of it is also derived from fear. So some of the messages like you equals to you, so undetectability equals untransmissibility, and reassurance around safety of dealing with people living with HIV, reassurance that if accidents happen um, along the way and they get exposed uh, occupationally to, to, to blood from somebody's HIV positive, uh, there is uh, post-exposure prophylaxis available. So there are measures in place to protect healthcare workers. And that is a, a great way to alleviate their fears um, um, as well. Uh, and finally, I think within the healthcare worker, uh, within the healthcare setting, some of the things that need to be done is, you know, inclusion of gradual inclusion of of these sensitive topics around key populations, the LGBT, um, uh, as part of the curriculum, and introducing it to medical students at a very early stage. Now, it has to be done sensitively; it needs to be agreed higher up. Um, at deanery level, at Ministry of Higher Education level, but that's the only way. Um, if healthcare workers are continuing with stigmatizing behavior as they continue to the workforce, you really need to start them with them early when, when they enter right. universities at least. Right. With that, thank you so much, Prof. It is so important for us to move away from the fear-based practices into evidence-based practices. Next, we will also also from the healthcare perspective, we'd like to ask Dr. Howie, one of the big problems majority is that majority of PLHIV, they present late. So how do you feel that we can improve testing so that people can come in at an earlier stage? Hi, good, good morning. I'm also waiting for a long time. Yeah, um, yeah so um, I would just want to share some some of the findings I got from a qualitative study that I did um, five years ago. So it was a study, qual qualitative study of uh, MSM, uh, men with sex with men, on the facilitators and barriers to HIV testing and treatments. So um, I think echo with uh, what all the panelists have said, like that the stigma um, is real, and also building on what Raymond has said, uh, MSM have uh, dual stigmas, like. Uh, you know, on top of HIV stigmas, there's, there's a homosexual, homosexuality stigma. So, um, and uh, also we heard from Prophet Skandar, the, uh, the healthcare, you know, settings, how some uh, stigmatizing behaviors um, may exist and also attitudes, uh, like what you uh, mentioned in the, uh, in the studies that uh, was done. So, um, when you are a sexual minority, like, why would you want to... Uh, disclose your behaviors to uh, healthcare providers uh, who might discriminate against you, right? You know, your, uh, so many of the participants, uh, high-risk key populations, uh, uh, I mean, um, populations would not feel comfortable, right, talking about uh, sensitive topics like uh, sexual behaviors and sexual identities, okay? And sex is still a taboo in our society to begin with, right? Why would you want to tell a stranger or if you are not comfortable to a doctor, right, right your, your intimate uh, behaviors to your doctors? So there's a lot of uh, fear, I mean, fear of disclosure and also, also fear of finding out the status because as you rightly mentioned, uh, HIV st uh, stigma is still a, a big issue. You know, um, if you are HIV positive, you, you'll be discriminated a lot, right? Uh, some, I, I learned that that you may even uh, lose your job in some um, uh, settings. And uh, some, I've also learned from, uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's true, like uh, 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 medical students who could not pursue their medication, uh, education because they were found, he was found to be HIV positive. 
you know, I mean, uh, and you no, know, yeah, this just um, is is a real issue. And um, so many of many of the, I mean, in my studies, participants, um, some of them delay testing because um, they they just do not want to uh, know, even though they have experienced symptoms or they might know that they might uh, be exposed to HIV. Yes. Um, other structures levels like uh, the cost. So fortunately, HIV testing is um, is free in public um, public health clinics, like, uh, like clinical settings. But again, uh, the persistent stigma and discrimination is uh, is common. Okay, uh, it's not just uh, the stigma and discrimination itself, but the perceived perception of stigma and discrimination, and uh, and also. Um, there are some other structural issues such as long wait time, right? And also, um, you know, how do you feel that you take one week to know your HIV status? I mean, after you get your testing, you have to wait one week. Would that be an very anxiety producing? You know? Uh, uh, yeah, so, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so many MSN would prefer to go to private uh, clinic for uh, for faster or more efficient services, and they, I mean they are also willing to pay more if they can, could afford, yeah, to, because to to avoid uh, uh, possible uh, stigma discrimination. So, uh, yeah. Okay, I think. That's okay, it. thank you, Doctor Howie. So we are moving on to the last. Uh, topic that we have for today it's about ending AIDS so the United Nations has developed from the millennial development goals into sustainable development goals it is a goal that it set out to be achieved by 2030 and in order for us to achieve this 17 goals so actually out of this 17 goals 10 of them are related to HIV and AIDS so they see that it is uh, dealing and addressing this HIV and AIDS uh, this epidemic is important in order for us to achieve this so they've come out with this ending AIDS fast track they hope to end it by 2030 and we have uh, tw the famous 90-90-90 targets by 2020 and by 2030 the 95-95-95 targets and as a midterm uh, target for 2025 they have suggested to uh, put all the put the people living with HIV and the communities at risk at the center of the response. And following up on that, we also have a national strategic plan uh, from 2015 by Ministry of Health. And actually, two of our panelists were also part of the consultation process in finalizing this document. So. It can be seen that there is commitment uh, both in the international level and also the national level to end AIDS by 2030. So I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Raymond, actually, how's the progress of us reaching this uh, UN AIDS 2025 goal? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, can I go to my slide again? So uh, I'm trying to make it as evidence-based as possible. So I've managed to pull out this chart uh, by the Ministry of Health that track where we are doing. So, you, so you're right about the 1990-90 principle. So 90% of people living with HIV know their status. 90% of those who live with HIV know their status and are receiving a, uh, HIV medication. And 90% of those who are on HIV are virally un uh, why really supported, suppressed, sorry. So based on that target, uh, the Ministry of Health tracked that in 2017, uh, for the first 90, we are 83%. For the second 90, we are 54%. And the third 90, we are 95%. Uh, on paper, it looks like a pretty decent score, especially for the first and the third target. Uh, but... Uh, as all things, when you're talking about uh, a measurement like this here, it's all about good data in, good data, uh, good out outputs out. So I do have some reason to suspect that the 83% of those tested uh, know, know the results. Uh, 
sorry, yeah, 83%. I think that's a that's on the high side. My guess, working in the community and seeing, we still pick up a lot of infections, a lot of people who have not got tested before, and these are key populations we are working with. I would think that figure is probably around 60 to 70 percent, my, my own guess. Yeah. So 83 percent by the ministry standard, satisfied, fine. But where I think we have failed is the 54 percent, which is that those who are diagnosed to be positive are on treatment. So we have to ask ourselves a question, why is the figure at 54 percent? It's not anywhere closer to 70 to 80 percent, right? So that's where I think uh, despite a very good healthcare system in the country, I think a lot of people are still facing stigma and discrimination that is preventing them from accessing uh, treatment in these clinics, although they are available. So we, we could have more discussion on that. Uh, but we agree with the third 90 there, which is that uh, we already reached that at 95%. So, but this is only pertaining to the community-friendly clinics that we have we are working with. Uh, we know that once you get in there, uh, together with the support from the NGOs uh, and, and very good doctors and counselors and, uh, and nurses, we find that most people do stay on treatment. And we know that the best way to uh, to be very undetectable is to stay on treatment for more than six months. So, so that is the government speaker. But I want to show you another chart. Uh, next one, can you move to the next slide? So, this one here is another Ministry of Health chart that is uh, to me very illuminating about what is the what is the challenge you're facing. So, here it is tracking uh, what has happened since two thousand and five to two 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 zero one eight. If you look at uh, the green bar that's declining, that's those are for injecting drug users. And for the pink bar is sexual transmission that's going up all the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So although nationally the HIV AIDS figure is coming down, the, uh, the, the decline is due to the fact that uh, we have been able to address injecting drug users. Many of the, 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 the new infections that we get every year has been declining to the point that in 2018, only 1% of the new infections are due to injecting drug users. But if you look at sexual transmission, we have been doing a fail rate, right? It's, it's fail rate because it's, not, it's been going up. Uh, and since 2015, it's been, there's still been a slight increase. It's just been plateaued. So that, that I think is worrying. Uh, so if we're saying, uh, if, we, if we cannot get the sexual transmission down, because nine, uh, if you look at the figure on the right there, you'll find that sexual transmission, both material sexual and normal sexual transmission, takes up the huge proportion of it. And more than half, 60%, are due to homosexual transmission. Uh, and, and we have to ask ourselves why it's a homosexual population that is uh, so much at risk. And... Uh, that's where stigma and discrimination has a role to play. They're not getting the information, they're not coming for, for testing, they're not coming for treatment. The next slide, please. Okay, I'll, I'll leave it at that first. We'll discuss that at the next question. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Mr. Raymond. Thank you for that. So we now know where where do we stand in regards to our process, our progress in the goals. Next, I would like to introduce everyone, introduce this to everyone. It's our penal code. You can understand it as our criminal law, our criminal code. So in section 377A and 377B, it is stated as such. Okay, so... Uh, any person who has sexual connection with another person by introduction of penis into the anus or mouth of another person is uh, to commit carnal kind of intercourse against the law of nature. And the origins of this is, uh, we our, our penal code is actually taken from India, uh, being part of the uh, British colonial at that time. And when we are ready to be uh, seek for our independence, we actually took it from India. But it's interesting for us to also take a look at India now. At 2018, the law has been repealed. 
So this three seven seven A and three seven this the whole section of three seven seven is you, uh, usually known as the sodomy law. So next one, I would like to post a question to uh Prof uh Prof Rajay Skanda as a clinician and a infectious disease specialist. Do you think criminalizing key populations hinders our progress? Uh, well, so I blame the British. These are British laws which were sent to all the, um, uh, which were adopted by all the criminals, um, which were adopted by all the Commonwealth countries. And so, um, and I think if I remember correctly, Theresa May, uh, in her capacity as uh, UK Prime Minister, apologised, went as far to apologise for um, uh, import for exporting these laws um, to all Commonwealth countries. So, you know, these these laws are outdated. They're from a, a pre, you know, colonial era, um, but they still sort of remain within our legal system. Um, and 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 politically, it has been used in the past, I guess, to criminalize. Um, uh, a certain politician based on, 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 on these laws, but otherwise not often used. Now, um, the criminalization, I think, and having these laws still in existence, uh, understandably drive uh, key populations, marginalized populations, away from being visible. Um, and um, uh, so it prevents programs uh, that are directed towards uh, the transgendered uh, and gay community um, away from these programs. So, for example, it discourages people to get tested, it discourages uh, key populations to get tested, it, pre it prevents them from coming forward if they are diagnosed positive to excess treatment, uh, it prevents them if they're on treatment from retaining in care. So, we know that. I mean, you know, it's not rocket science, it's, it, 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 we, we know that. And I think uh, as part of our responses in totality, we need to address the legal system. It is a bit more difficult in this country uh, with a lot of sensitivities around um, uh, you know, religion, etc. Um, but it's doable. India has done it, uh, and I think they've set the um, precedents uh, for other countries maybe to follow through. I think Singapore is looking at it uh, as well. Uh, and so maybe now is a good time to do it. But that's not the question. The question was something else. Uh, it prevents, so it does prevent key populations from accessing care ultimately. Right. Thank you so much, Prof. All right. That's that a good question, by the way. <laughs> we, I think we are leave them to the uh, end of our session. So uh, we will be doing a closing round table now. Uh, after this, we'll address the questions and we will close. So uh, what this round table is about is that this year's uh, theme for World AIDS Day, it's global solidarity as a shared responsibility. And if we can look at the 2019 theme, it's communities make the difference so it is uh, it is obvious and important for us to look at how are they uh, emphasizing on the importance of meaningful partnerships in order to end AIDS. So uh, with this, can I uh, ask uh, Dr. Howie, what should the, uh, what, what kind, in your opinion, what are the most impactful public health investments? to end it that we should be looking into. Okay, uh, I, I cannot share screen, uh, it, but it's okay. I will have a... Uh, uh, I, you, you should be able to share now. Okay. Can you right. see this picture? Uh, not yet, but yes, we can now. Okay, so uh, there's really no one's uh, no one size fits all kind of intervention program, right? There's no single bullets, uh, silver uh, silver bullets for the battle against HIV. We know that there are multiple uh, sub epidemics okay, within HIV epidemics. So, um, so the um, more than ten years ago, the risk, um, the experts have came up with this idea of a combination um, HIV 
combination prevention. So we know that uh, so on the top right is treatments and antiretroviral STI anti antiviral. So we know now U equal to U. So uh, in the in the video that you guys showed made, yeah, that is the, I think a very important part of the of this um this fight against HIV, right? Um, so getting people tested, getting people um, on treatments is really, really important. But let's not forget about uh, behavioral change, you know, condom use, um, you know, uh, reducing uh, sex sexual partners, adherence to harm reduction strategies. They are all behavioral change uh, strategies, okay? We, uh, right? And then uh, biomedical strategies, the new ones, like you mentioned, uh, PrEP, HIV PrEP, and also PEP. Okay, these are also the new, the uh, newer biomedical strategies that should also be part of these uh, combinations. Okay, and last but not least, the social uh, social justice and human rights aspect of it. So we talk about the penal code. We talk about the policy, the laws uh, against transgender women in Malaysia. All of these are driving uh, the stigmas. Right? So that's how we have um, so much this social. Uh, discriminations, you know, stigma discrimination because the human rights of the key populations are not respected, right? And then uh, that's why they don't want to go to the healthcare services. Why they, why do they want to, 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 be, to, to be told to, to change their um, behaviors or identities, you know, it's part of who they are, right? So, um, so pin, yeah, the, the criminalization is that we call it the, the structural levels uh, intervention. So we, the, um, we, without removing the, the laws, the, the punitive policies, I think it's very hard to change the, the societal attitudes yeah, towards uh, LGBT people and also um, uh, other marginalized populations. Right, right. Right, thank, thank you, and, Dr. Uh, Dr. Obviously, the oh. community involvements, I've always, we also mentioned uh, from uh, yeah. uh, Raymond, yeah. And leadership yeah, on the left hand side right okay so no silver bullet and there has to be a multi uh, we multi have to work and multi levels yeah multi-dimensional multi-level uh, works is required thank you dr Howie. so uh next we'd like to ask uh, miss nisha so among the issues that we have discussed today we went from this uh, stigma and discrimination to challenges that we face and we touched even a little bit on the legal system in Malaysia. So what are the most urgent actions that we need from a community's perspective in order to end AIDS? Okay, thank you so much. Um, I would say the most urgent or current uh, action that can be can be taken was, uh, as mentioned as Prof Iskandar, Iskandar mentioned earlier on, sens sensitization uh, among the key stakeholders. Uh, and this is related with the health providers from all sectors here yeah? and why so because i believe by by, by doing so it, it will create at least and uh discussion among these health providers in related with this uh, marginalized community on how to deal with them on how to actually uh uh call them right and and and, and so on right and how to actually engage with them uh as being a health provider and a, and a patient Right, and at the same time, with the current situation of the COVID pandemic, uh, when it comes to the community, I would say financial aid is so important because uh, this also will, will assist uh, the community in regards of their livelihood, which also will relate with uh, the 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 HIV AIDS uh, work in and, and so on, right? Um, and uh, one thing that I noticed that uh, a lot of people would not want to talk about is substance abuse. Uh, and this is uh, a most current issue. Uh, and, and, and thanks to Jane, uh, she actually mentioned this to me uh, yesterday, uh, which is uh, a lot of our uh, trans community out there, especially those sex workers, right? Uh, they are subjected to substance abuse because of the... Uh, uh, demand from customers, you know, where they will pay you if you take uh, drugs and so on. And we can see the high rates of, of trans people, trans people sex workers who are not using uh, protection when it comes when they are basically being uh, using substance abuse. Uh, so 
we need to have more uh, discussion on this matter and more uh, mental health uh, support in related with this matter because this relates with uh, HIV AIDS work at the same time. And there are lack of mental health uh, assistance when it comes to such matter. Uh, furthermore, when it comes to transgender patients, uh, they are also lack of information on how to deal with transgender patient. So yes, I would say that's that's basically it. Thank you, Ms. Nishka, because uh, looking at the that it's very multidimensional. Sometimes it's easy for people to lose focus on the most urgent things that is required at the moment. Thank you again. So you. Uh, next, Ian, as a youth and as a medical student, how do you see yourself playing a role into reducing stigma and discrimination towards PLHIV? Well, I think it's that uh, in regards to the youth, uh, for us, I think it's very important for us to have a proactive role in society. Uh, I think let's not talk about, let's put it aside. let's talk about the COVID-19 pandemic, for, for example. I think in, in Malaysia, it's like most medical students, Kind of, we, we pretty much sat back. We didn't really take an active role in dealing with this pandemic because, uh, or maybe also we weren't given an opportunity to do so uh, per se. Or then again, also, it's like, it's both sides. So, uh, from what I understand, it's like uh, in, in America, I read, I read something on uh, when, when the pandemic first struck, like students at Harvard uh, Medical School, they immediately set up like a, I think like they set up like a nationwide volunteer kind of uh, they mobilized like a like a whole army of medical volunteers that uh, help the frontliners. Even if even even if they even if these medical students didn't help in the medical perspective, they were helping the frontliners maybe take care of their families or like do their like doing their laundry or just easing the easing their responsibilities as frontliners just to just to give a bit of a perspective. So I'd say that yeah, it's maybe it's a mentality thing in in like in Malaysia that we do need to kind of uh, shift towards thinking like how, how can we contribute? Uh, it, it takes time, I would say. Uh, other things is that I think other ideas I can think of is that our generation is essentially the social media generation or the content creation generation. That, And when I mean content creation, it's basically things like YouTube, Instagram, all these TikTok or like all these media platforms that uh, a lot of like influencers use to share uh, on any any topic, any topic can be can be turned into a video nowadays. And like what Erase did, uh, turning HIV into into like sharing sharing about HIV in a in a video format, in a very easily dissectable video format. I think was that that's essentially what I mean. So like moving forward, if we like want to make HIV as a topic more accessible to the lay public, we need to we need to like kind of in a way like market it to be like uh, uh like in a in a yeah in an easily packageable way or in a sexy way so things like maybe if you if you share if like you get influencers or people like like you like local like local producers or i don't know like one i can think of is probably like jenny boy like people that the youth can relate to if they talk about hiv in 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 like their videos in a very fun way in a very like subtle way instead of like in your face we're talking about HIV they, they turn into like a story kind of way and you and utilize these social media platforms I think like the youth will get more tuned tuned into it I remember like there was one video uh, where they essentially taught people how to use a condom like one of the one of the YouTube one of the local YouTubers did that it's, it was like it was like this guy trying to buy condoms in a pharmacy and then he was very shy and then like there was this pharmacist there was this like this pharmacist uh who kind of explained it using a using a banana? Uh, it's just like very. It was very subtle. It was. It's like very subtle. It's not like it's not teaching you. It's not like teaching right. you about about uh, about sex education, but it's like kind right. of doing it in a very like in in a very like relatable kind of uh, right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thank so, you. So, so, so yeah, it's like getting the message across, getting the right message to the right audience, using the right way that is attractive to them. Thank you so much, Ian. Right. Uh, next one, we'd like to ask uh, <clears throat> Mr. Raymond on can we end AIDS without eliminating stigma and discrimination? 
Thank you. Uh, I think by now you know my answer is definitely no. Uh, I think the data that is coming out, uh, the evidence that is coming out is also showing that. Uh, I think uh, I find that our government, our Ministry of Health has uh, been very uh, proactive in tackling HIV and AIDS in Malaysia and I applaud that. I know we can do better there, uh, but the whole issue about stigma and discrimination, not just towards uh, people living with HIV, but uh, towards the key population, is uh, is not openly discussed. And, and 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 I think that's that's the failure of our healthcare public health policy. If we want to talk about ending AIDS, that has to really be seriously taken aboard. Um, but in the context of the the children, uh, the, 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 the sorry, the students in this uh, in this forum who's attending, I think there's seventy six of you at the moment. Uh, I think all of you are the future leaders, are the future uh, healthcare uh, providers, and it your your opinion and how, what how you represent yourself is so important. Uh, I think we as a, as as Malaysians. We could be a lot more open to talk about sex. If we can't even talk about sex, how do you talk about safe sex, right? So, right, so right. we need to have the permission and uh, encourage uh, more more young people to be talking about sex. Of course, when you talk about sex, it's not about going to porn sites and all that only. It's about risks and responsibilities. It's about how the young population can be more responsible in talking about sex, and that includes yeah. prevention, risk, that sort of thing. Prevention and protection. Sure, yeah. The, right. the the last thing I want to say is that uh, we always we're interacting every day on social media and in, in person and everything, uh, and I think it's high time that we do not think that this world is uh, just a, a, a binary world of straight people and and, and gay people or just men right. and women only. That we yeah. must recognize that it's a spectrum. There are many gender that need to be respected. There are many right. sexual orientation that is respected, right. and because all these things are not visible. Uh, you don't, you can't tell the person whether it's gay or, or, or lesbian and all that. I think we need to be very inclusive in everything that we do in our speech that we use. Yep. To be respectful that these people are our friends, our family, and our patients in, in time to come. So if right. we show that respect, I think more people will be feeling less stigmatized and more willing to be uh, uh, attending public health care and behavioral change. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Mr. Raymond. Thank you. So, uh, last one will be to Prof. Prof, how do we create a more meaningful partnership to end it in 2025? Uh, 2030, sorry. Yeah, thank you for the question. So, I think ultimately the HIV response historically has been based on partnerships. Um, so, for example, um, in every country, we have partnerships with community at the center, um, which is very much like what, what this panel is on. We have, we're talking about HIV and we have community-based organization representatives and people representing the community who have the loudest voices here as well. And so that's how any HIV response should be. It should also be done, of course, in conjunction with Ministry of Health, with academia. So Howie is well represented here. Uh, infectious disease physicians. Uh, I'm wearing that hat today. Um, and more importantly, and you know, as, as the, 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 the good thing about this particular um, webinar uh, and, and whole program is that it is about the youth um, and the solutions to the HIV response also lies very much in the youth um, because you have you are you have the solutions you are going to be providing the answers for the future and you have the voices that will change what happens next um so yeah so i think it's important to continue that partnership with community in the center but with an increasing voice from students and from the youth right thank you prof so it's not enough with having uh more partnerships but it is important for us to look into more youth participation in this Right. Uh, I understand that uh, we need we we need to take a photo. Is that right, Balkis? Yeah. Uh, I think that's okay. 
Right. Do you want to conduct this photo session? Hold on here. Let me ask someone to screenshot. Okay, so... Tell us when to smile. Yeah, <laughs> please. One more. <laughs> okay, so... Let me... Uh, one, I'm two... I'm just talking you guys to... <laughs> okay, okay. Ready? One, two, three. Okay, I think one more, one more time. Smile. One, two, three. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Balkis. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you, Prof. Again for answering that. Now back to the discussion is that we are at the end of our panel today, and we do receive a lot of questions in our Q and A section. So I hope that uh, I would like to request the kind assistance from from all our panelists to help to type in the answer because we, we do not have the uh, time for us to go through one of them one by one. So maybe we'll just take one for us to answer live. Uh, okay. Uh, so, hi, how, how does the transgender community actually get related and involved in majority? majorly in HIV and AIDS. What's this question? Okay, I'm trying to understand it. Okay, never mind. We can just try to type in the answers later. Uh, okay, let's take this one. How can medical students play a part in advocacy in these issues? Because young people are really busy with things. And how do we avoid advocacy fatigue? Prof, do you want to take this? I think you need to get Ian to take that because he's been a fantastic um, advocate for medical students. So I insist that he answers that question because he's well, been Ian? he's been <laughs> completely. The floor is yours, Ian. Uh, I'm, I guess in regards to the first question, uh, advocacy in these issues, like joining a race would be considered playing a part in advocacy towards this issue, whoever it joins these. Advocacy, like um, joining it, there's definitely opportunities out there if you're willing to stay curious, stay, like, stay hungry, stay curious and keep asking questions, then you like keep an open mind. The opportunities are always out there in order for you to explore. And in regards to like young people already too busy with handling studies, family issues, I think it's that if you have the right mindset or like the, like, the right commitment towards, uh, towards that particular issue, these, like, these things about studies, family issues, uh, whatnot and whatnot, they are they are kind of, uh, they, they shouldn't be, they shouldn't hinder you from doing what you do. If you have a commitment, then you'll find a way. You will, you have to have a confidence in yourself that you'll find strategies down the line uh, to, to, to deal with these issues. Yeah. Because if you always have the mentality saying that I'm too busy, then nothing's going to get done. Yeah. Can I just add, there's also a huge personal satisfaction and gratification for being an advocate. It's separate from what you do. We have a great example in everybody in this panel, and particularly Prof. Adiba. You know, so we've all dedicated our lives to this advocacy. And, you know, Nisha, just look at the amount of achievement she's had. But the personal satisfaction that goes along with helping people who are more vulnerable goes a long way, and which drives, which continues to drive everybody um, day after day. So there is no such thing. I mean, there is, there, there is such thing as advocacy fatigue, but you just get over it because you know you're helping somebody else. Mm. Right. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Ian and Prof, for answering if that. If I can jump in, if I can jump in there, uh, thank you. Yeah, kind please, of for that. Yeah. Uh, it's and it's not just a personal satisfaction. I think it it truly makes you a better person. Um, you know, because. Uh, 
I, I don't know about many of you behind the screens there, but I lead a very sheltered life um, growing up. And certainly, uh, if not for my involvement in HIV AIDS, uh, I truly would not have seen, um, you know, how others uh, live and how others, um, you know, the, 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 the challenges that people who are not from the same kind of uh, circles as, as myself um, go through on a daily basis. And with that, I think uh, it, it does make you, um, it does make you a better person. It does make you grateful every single day of your life. And, um, you know, um, and, and, and that becomes, um, a cycle where uh, you you give more and you get more in return. All right, thank you for the input. Okay, can, wait. Can I just thank jump you. in? Uh, yes, please, Mr. Rima. Yeah, we are short on one. time, but yeah, please make one. it short. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think the best way to involve, get involved, uh, especially for, for the uh, young medical students and yourselves, is to join the NGO. Uh, I think uh, Seed Foundation or my NGO PT Foundation. We do and uh, we do collaborate and provide internships. and have many volunteers from uh, all, all walks of life. So you're free to come in. And some of the feedback we get from our volunteers is that that's the best thing they've done uh, because by coming in, uh, they see what's happening. They mingle with the community, and it's the best way to really break down stigma and discrimination. Thank you. Right, thank you for sharing that to us, uh, Mr. Raymond. So with that, we have to close the session. Uh, it has been a wonderful Saturday morning and I hope everyone uh, enjoyed it uh, as much as uh, I have. And uh, we need to be aware that, uh, we need to be reminded that even in this COVID-19 pandemic, HIV still exists and ensuring access to healthcare services to all populations is the only way forward. So unless we can uh, openly talk about these issues, stigma and discrimination, the uh, lack of uh, comprehensive sexuality education, we will not be able to solve this. And again, echoing what uh, the team of the World AIDS Day, it's global solidarity uh, as a shared responsibility. So we all have a role to play. And from what Prof Adiba has said earlier, in the opening is that we don't have to wait for the right time. We can do it on a day-to-day -day basis. So again, I thank all the panelists for being here with us. And I thank all the participants who stayed throughout uh, this session. And I'm glad that we get to hear from the perspectives of from our panelists and also found uh, discuss about some possible solutions for us to move uh, forward. Right. So thank you, everyone. I will pass the floor back to Balkis. Okay, thank you so much, uh, speakers on the floor and the moderator for such a comprehensive point of views. Like I rather say it is an eye opening perspective with regards to HIV and AIDS and how it relates to the current COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you so much once again. Um, so, just inform that we'll have a five minute break for a while, okay? Thank you. Stay tuned for the next activity for staying with us. Now, let's proceed to our next session. I'd like to take this, this opportunity to thank Nilatex for sponsoring our day one event. I'd like to invite Mr. Tharampal Singh, the executive director of Nilatex Sundarian Berhad to give a short presentation and have a Q&A session about safe sex and contraception. Dear participants, you can put up your questions anonymously in the Q&A feature in this Zoom. If you have any doubts or concerns regarding the presentation, please welcome Mr. Tharampa. Thank you very much, Balkis. Uh, I know we have had a very serious session in the morning and now let me get you to the fun things. I'm gonna share my screen, uh, just to give you a bit of flavor about our company. And uh, well, I hope you can see it now. Uh, can you see my screen? 
Hello, um, Malkis, could you see, can you see my screen? Yes, yeah. I can see and hear you. Right, welcome to New Latex. Um, we have put the frame there, the acronym CRIME. Uh, so we're not going to make you create any crimes, but we're going to share with you something. Okay, uh, we believe we are the choice crime partner. Um, Okay, what does crime mean? Basically, it's customer satisfaction. We are reactive to customer needs. We continuously innovate. Yes, there are lots of innovations in the condom industry. We manage an order from start to end, and we are excellent in driving, uh, delivering needs. So moving on further, who are we? Uh, we are a manufacturer located in Kluang, Johor. We can produce up to 500 million condoms per year. We export to around about 30 different countries. Uh, we produce a wide range of condoms for both institutional and private markets. And all our condoms comply, comply with international standards. We are already accredited with the CE mark, ISO, SAPS, USA 510K. And our products are right now available on Shopee, Lazada, and PG Mall. Right. Most interesting, how are condoms made? Um, not too sure if anybody out there knows, but let me just share a little bit with you, okay? Condoms are made from rubber trees. We collect, the latex is collected, goes to the latex supplier for some processing, okay? The latex supplier is then processing the latex. They produce various kinds of latex. And what we are buying is a pre-vulcanized latex. That means it's already added with some chemicals for stabilizing, and removing a doll. So the latex from supplier actually reaches new latex. We check the quality of the latex. We ensure that it meets our requirements. And we then go on. We receive the latex. We go through a small compounding process. Condoms are a dipped product. Yes, you see glass bowls. Uh, it's a dipping process. And the condoms are formed on the glass bowls. So the size of the glass bowls uh, determines the size of the condom. Yeah, All the condoms go through 100% electronic testing. Every single condom is electronically tested to ensure that they are free from holes. Yeah, And then we foil the condoms. That is the condom that you will get as a consumer. During the foiling process, the condoms are also lubricated with silicon oil, right? And if there are flavors needed, flavors are added. Now you might ask, what about colored condoms? That happens during the dipping process. And then we actually pack all the condoms according to the customer requirements in the three-piece pack, 12-piece pack, six-piece pack, and so on. Condoms are then quality checked to ensure that right now the condoms are safe for use by the consumer. Right? Then we pack them, ready to ship, and then they are shipped to customers. What we have shown there is a ship. Sometimes they go by sea, sometimes they go by lorries. Now, a little bit of history of condoms. Whenever I ask this question to people, when do you think the first condom was used? Everybody tells me mid-90s, 1900s, and so on and so forth. Let me share a big secret with you. Condoms started their history in 3000 BC. King Minos of Crete was the first one to use a condom. There are various, various content here. Some say he used the goat gallbladder. Some say he used fish gut. Nothing concrete yet. Ancient Greeks, Gre ancient Egyptians were the first civilization to use sheets to prevent tropical diseases like Bilharzia. China, oil silk paper or lamb intestines or of tortoise shell or animal horn were used. France started using sheep guts in the 1640s. Yeah. In 1855, rubber was introduced as a component. And these rubber versions could be washed and reused. And of course, reusing is not good at all. But there you are. But in those days, nobody was wiser. In 1912, the introduction of latex condoms, cheap and disposable, came in. By World War II, latex condoms were mass produced and given to troops all over the world. And in 1950s, latex condoms are improved improved by making them thinner, tighter, and lubricated. 
The reservoir tip is introduced that collects semen in the end, decreasing the risk of leakage and unintentional pregnancy. So condoms keep on moving and continue. Today, what are the types of condoms? You have male condoms and female condoms. Um, I'm focusing more on the male condoms. <laughs> so you can see huge variety of condoms, different types, different colors, different sizes, different shapes, different sh textures. So we have everything for everyone, right? Do's and don'ts. Now, a lot of people make the mistake of saying that they can use the same condom for various sex. And we say, no, you got to change the condom every time you change the form of sex that you have, okay? Condom must be put on before having sex. Please do read the package instruction and also watch out for the expiration date, okay? Make sure there are no tears or condoms are free from defects. When you put on, just give it a quick glance. You don't want to lose the moment. Store the condoms in a cool, dry place. Uh, do use latex, polyurethane, or polyisoprene condoms. And if you are using additional lubricant, do use a water-based or silicone-based lubricant. What are the don'ts? Don't ever store condoms in the heat. Don't leave it in your car. If you're putting it in your pocket, don't keep it too hot. <laughs> Condoms get warm. And try to avoid using nonoxinal line. It's a spermicide and it can be, it has been shown to be not safe for women. Okay. Don't use oil based products like baby oil, lotion, petroleum, petroleum jelly, or cooking oil because this can cause the condom to break. And don't use more than one condom at a time and definitely don't reuse a condom. Now, a lot of people say, I hate condoms. Wait, but why? Um, some of you might have heard all the excuses. It doesn't fit. It's too tight. It's not comfortable. I don't know how to put it on. I feel better without a condom. I want to feel you inside me. I want to feel your heat. It'll be more intimate. And many, many excuses. Uh, we need to be socially responsible. We need to be very careful as people that we want to protect, we want to have safe sex, we want to have, we want to be also responsible to society. So for all the young people, honestly, if you're not married or you don't want to bring life into this world for which you cannot be responsible, you don't want sickness, no excuse not to use some safety. Yeah. So that was a very short presentation and we are open to questions that you may have and anything that you'd like to ask. So back to you, Balkis. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Tharpa. So um, participants, do you have any question? You can put it up uh, the Q&A feature on the Zoom. Don't worry, your questions will be completely anonymous. So. So, okay, we have one question from, a, from an anonymous attendee. So, is the condoms produced biodegradable? Okay. Yes, they are. Uh, rubber by nature is biodegradable. Uh, the carbon life cycle of a condom, raw condom, is relatively short. Unfortunately, the silicon oil has a very long carbon life cycle. But principally, condoms are made of rubber. Rubber does biodegrade. Anyone else? Any doubts, any concerns regarding the topic just now? Okay, but if there are any questions ever that anybody has and they're too shy to ask us, you can always get through, reach us through Erase. Uh, oh. but um, sorry, Mr. Tarnpal, there's another question. Oh, sure. Actually, there's two. Okay. Uh, first one is, there a difference between ultra thin and thick condoms in terms of providing protection? Okay. Good question. Um, basically, 
there has been a lot of studies between thin and thick condoms. Now, initially, thick condoms were introduced more for anal sex or prolonged sex. Okay. There has been a study done by several manufacturers which has shown that there is no significant difference in the safety factor. Right? So, ultra-thin condoms meet, have to meet the same specification before they are put into the market like and same with the thick condoms. So, in terms of providing protection, they're the same. However, if you're having more anal sex, my personal recommendation would be use the thicker condom yeah, to provide you a little bit more safety. But in reality, there's no data to say one is better than the other. Okay. Okay, uh, next question. How to carefully dispose condoms? Right. Good question again. Definitely, please do not flush it down the toilet. <laughs> okay. So we would always advise you to wrap, remove the used condom, make sure none of the semen has gotten onto your partner or flown out. Wrap it up uh, in a tissue paper and dispose it in the dustbin. Yeah. That's the only thing we can do now. There is no sort of uh, medical dustbin that you can throw it into. That's the best way to dispose. Yeah. Not in the toilet. Okay. Um, it's another one. What are the quality control assessment for the condom? And do the latex undergo a say to check for impurities before accepted use okay. for making condom? Good question. Now, let, let me tell you, uh, I have to go back a little bit. Now, condoms are classified as a medical device, right? So we are immediately bound by medical device regulations, right? So it means we have to register the product with the MMDA. If you're launching in the, US, uh, in the EU, you have to, it is a medical device class 2B and the highest grade is class 3. So you can imagine that there has to be a lot of work done. We have to make sure all the condoms that are produced go through a biocompatibility test a toxicological approval, clinical evaluations. So if you see the amount of work that is gone into developing the whole file, and this is using the latex that you are manu manufacturing the condoms with. If you are using more than two types of latex, you actually have to create a technical file for each latex. So that goes to clearly show that once the latex is approved, most manufacturers do not want to change the latex. That's the first part. The second part is every lot of latex that comes in has to be approved by our quality department that it meets our specifications. The suppliers have to assure us that there's been no change in the chemical composition of the latex as well. Now, once we have produced the condoms, all the condoms are actually physically tested. Now, random sampling by batch, and they undergo testing according to an international standard called ISO 4074, where you're testing the physical properties of the condoms to ensure that the condoms are safe for use before they are released to the consumer. So quite a lot of work goes in. And so if, you, if you're buying a condom from a reliable brand, a reliable manufacturer, I would say it's very safe to use. So a lot of points are taken and as I said, we also randomly, for an example, are required to do microbiological testing on the condoms to ensure that there's no microbiological infection on the condom as well, right? So much work. It's a medical device at the end of the day and, of course, used for a lot of fun, but it's, a, it's safe. Right? I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you, Mr. Tarpa. And then this is another interesting question. Why do some condoms have flavors? All right, good. <laughs> um, here, let me ask you all, interesting question. How many types of sex are there? Now, let me just give you a few examples. Um, you have vaginal sex, you have anal sex, you have oral sex, you have actual physical sex, you have virtual sex, 
you have imaginary sex you have hand sex feet sex body sex visual sex auditory sex so huge amount of different kinds of sex now keeping that in mind now to address your question why do condoms have flavors basically flavors were added for oral sex that's why you have the nasi lemak flavor you have the kopitiam flavor and of course the standard fruit flavors uh it's just to add variety right the reality is uh sex is enjoyed in a plenitude of ways by different people in different ways so obviously that's where the flavors have come in okay we make sex a many splendid thing okay i guess there's that's it there's no more questions thank you so much mr tharampal and i'd like to thank nila taxi number had as well for sponsoring day one event it's such a huge um we appreciate it a lot okay so um all right that's the end of the nila taxi session thank you mr tharampal thank you have a good day everybody bye bye okay bye bye all right ladies and gentlemen that's the end of day 1 eras 2020 i'd like to thank participants for joining us in today's event on behalf of eras i apologize for any delays and inconvenience caused throughout this whole event i hope that those joining us today are able to gain extra knowledge and have a broader view on dealing with this issue with an open mind and a positive perception towards people living with hiv and aids Thank you so much for staying with us throughout this session. Don't forget to follow our official accounts on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter for more events like this in the future. Stay safe and have a good week ahead. Bye-bye. Reminder, please help us uh, fill in this evaluation form after the event. I mean, for the post-event evaluation day one of Iris. Yeah, thank you so much. The link is in the chat box.